if I happen to be running away from a, somebody trying to mug me or rob me, and I happen to get really unlucky, like this is a really unlucky day, a really bad day, if I happen to be running away from a robber, and then I happen to get to the edge of a cliff, and I run off the edge of a cliff. Like it was bad when I was going to get robbed, but now I'm going to run off the edge of a cliff. Let's say I happen to run off the edge of that cliff straight off like this. What would the shape of my path look like? If you watch the old cartoons, Wile E. Coyote, I don't know if you even know who that is. Wile E. Coyote would run it like this, and the Wile E. Coyote laws of gravity would only kick in when he looks down. So he runs out, he stops, and then he looks down, and then he falls down. Clearly, that's not the actual path that I'm going to follow as I run off the edge of this cliff. So what is the path going to look like? Is it going to be a circle? Like this? Is it going to be uh, some other kind of curved shape? Let's draw a few options here. Circle? Is it going to be, we'll call this one a parabola. Is it going to be a parabola? Is it going to be that square or that rectangle? What do we got? Option one, two, or three? It is the shape that we called yesterday a parabola. Okay, this parabola that some of you have learned about in math class, some of you haven't. You see the shape that we see right here is actually a half a parabola, but for those of you who are familiar with parabolas, if we extended this backwards, it would form this complete parabola. The equation that we're going to use to describe this later on, you're going to see, is actually, for those of you who have done this in math class, is the equation for a parabola. For those of you who haven't done it in math class, that's okay. You're not going to be like lost because you don't know what a parabola is. But I do want you to remember the shape of the path of a projectile, which is an object that moves through the air under the influence of just gravity, is a parabola. Every single time, if it's under the influence of just gravity. A projectile is an object that moves through the air under the influence of gravity, and the path that it takes is always a parabola, or a half a parabola, or a third of a parabola. It depends, and it depends upon how long it's in the air for and at what angle it was launched from, but we still call it a parabola, nonetheless. So we know from our demonstration that we just did that the horizontal component of this, and we do have two components of projectile motion, right? It's a parabola with an x and a y. The horizontal component, or the x component, um, doesn't have any forces acting on it. There's no gravity or anything like that, so it's constant velocity. And because of that, we would describe the horizontal component of the projectile motion with this equation, v is equal to d over t, the very first equation we learned this year. The vertical component is acceleration because it's a result of gravity. We would describe that vertical component with any of my acceleration equations, but I'll tell you what, the one that you're most likely to use, or at least the one that you're most likely to be successful with, is this one. d is equal to vit plus 1 half at squared. They're all valid because it involves acceleration, but this is the one that you're going to try first because it's the one that you're going to use the most often. So understand that right, we break things into x and y components. We've done that before. We're going to do the same thing here, except it's going to be a little bit different. We're going to describe x by this equation because the horizontal velocity isn't changing. We're going to describe y by this equation because the vertical velocity is changing. It's under the influence of gravity. Just like that bullet that I dropped straight down beside the bullet that we fired, or just like that steel ball that we dropped that was right beside the, the uh, steel ball that we fired out. So if I launch 
a ball or a football, a football, a soccer ball, a, a baseball, or if I just throw something or I just kick something or I just fire something out of a gun or a missile launcher or whatever the case may be, it's going to follow this parabolic path, this parabola like this. The horizontal motion or the horizontal component of this ball or this missile or whatever it happens to be isn't going to change. No matter where we are, the horizontal velocity will always be the same. And the reason is because there are no forces acting on it to cause it to speed up or slow down horizontally. But vertically, vertically, it's moving upwards with a certain speed initially, but because of gravity, that speed decreases. Reach the top, there is no vertical velocity. But then, of course, when it starts coming back down, there's a vertical velocity that increases. Increases, increases, increases until it reaches the bottom. So we've got a horizontal velocity that remains constant. We've got a vertical velocity that is increasing. It stops vertically and then, de and then increases in the opposite direction because of gravity on the way down. Does that make sense? If I was to plot a graph of the horizontal position versus the time, what would that graph look like? Anyone? It's constant velocity. What does a graph look like when it's constant velocity? It looks like this. So horizontal position versus time would look like this. What about a graph of vertical position versus time? The y component versus time. Well, the vertical position versus time would look like this. That's effectively what we're measuring there, right? Now, the horizontal position versus time is a straight line graph. We would describe that by the equation V equals D over T. It's exactly what we said we'd describe the X component by. This one is an upside down parabola. And if you remember from math class, those of you who have taken parabolas in math class, the equation that describes a parabola is, you guys remember what it is? We've got a few grade 12 students. They know for sure what a parabola is. Y is equal to, you don't have to write this equation down right now, okay? You can write the next one down in a second here. Y is equal to AX squared plus BX plus C, yeah? What equation did I say we use to describe this usually? The y component? d is equal to vit plus 1 half at squared. Well, if we rearrange this a little bit, we get df is equal to 1 half at squared plus vit plus di. Look at it. df is y. A is one half of the acceleration, which, by the way, is negative 9.81, meaning it's an upside down parabola. X is the time, because time is on our x axis here, right? Plus BX, or VI, B, times T, plus DI, which is C in our parabola equation. How many of you remember parabolas from math class a little bit? Okay, did what I say just make sense? If you don't remember parabolas from math class, if you've never learned them, that's okay. Okay, in the end, if you haven't learned about parabolas, then you're just going to have to do this, right? which is the physics part of it anyways. I just thought I'd tie it into what you've learned in math class if you've learned it in math class. So we've got constant velocity horizontally that we're describing by this graph and this equation. We've got accelerated motion vertically that we'd represent by this graph and this equation. Now it's time to do a problem. Okay, so let's take a look at our first problem that's going to appear in your textbook. This is, by the way, chapter 2 in your textbook, 2.10. So if you haven't downloaded that, then it might be a good idea to do that if you're grabbing a copy of the textbook. Page 107, it says, Head smashed in Buffalo Jump near Fort McLeod, Alberta, is a UNESCO heritage site. How many people have ever been to Head smashed in Buffalo Jump? Okay, 
All of you should go. Like, it's not that far away. Um, and it's neat, actually. It says, over 6,000 years ago, the Blackfoot people of the plains uh, hunted the North American bison by gathering herds and directing them over cliffs 20 meters tall. So it's so simple but brilliant, right? You want to hunt these bison. What's the easiest way to hunt these bison? Well, bison aren't known to be the smartest animals in the world, so you trick them into running off the edge of a cliff. They run off the edge of a cliff. Guess what? They die. Um, it's simple but brilliant. Um, assuming the plane was flat so that the bison ran horizontally off the edge of the cliff, like right here, off the edge of the cliff, and the bison were moving at a maximum speed of 18 meters per second at the time of the fall, we want to know how far from the base of the cliff the bison actually landed. So here's what we want to do whenever we come across a question like this. It's a, it's a projectile motion question. We know this is projectile motion, right? Because when we run off the edge of the cliff, we're going to follow that parabolic path off the edge of the cliff. What we want to do is first draw a diagram. Here's my cliff. Here's my bison. Now, I'm not necessarily the best drawer of a bison in the world. We'll give him a little red tail. He's got a happy face there. Got a happy face because he's just out for a run, thing, having fun, right, with his buddies. Doesn't realize until he runs off the edge of the cliff that he's going to die in the next couple seconds. He's running at, oh, how fast is he moving? 18 meters per second. So let's label that, 18.0 meters per second. And the height of this cliff, let's just make this a little bit bigger so we have more space. The height of this cliff is 20.0 meters. Let's draw out the shape of this bison's path. This happy, he's happy right here, and then he goes out here, and, he, and he's like, uh-oh, uh-oh, this is not good. Until he hits the ground there and... Well, now he's not thinking anything. Our question is, how far from the base of the cliff did he land? In other words, we're looking for this variable, whatever that is, right there. So we've drawn our diagram, and we do that every time we see one of these problems. Don't skip that step. You see, get a projectile motion problem, draw a diagram. And then we break it into X and Y components. Every time we have, every time we have uh, something that has horizontal motion and vertical motion at the same time, we've got to break it into X and Y components. We're dealing with those components differently now, but we still break it into those components. Now, what equation will always, always describe the horizontal motion for me? No exceptions to this. We've got V equals D over T, right? Why do we have V equals D over T? Well, look, this horizontal velocity remains at 18 the whole way. Okay, it's constant velocity because there's no forces acting on it horizontally. There's no reason for it to speed up or slow down horizontally. It remains at 18 meters per second. Now, the vertical component, on the other hand, we're going to use an acceleration equation for that one because, because it accelerates. If it was moving upwards, which in this case it's actually not, it runs horizontally off the edge of the cliff, but if it was moving upwards, it would slow down at 9.81 vertically, and then as it comes back down, it would speed up at 9.81 vertically. Now, what's the general strategy for solving these problems? Well, I like these ones. I, I like these problems because they're, they're very concrete. You know, kick a football, where's it going to land? But also because... There isn't really much of a strategy. It's just sub numbers in. Sub in what you got and solve for something. Sometimes you're going to solve for what you're looking for right away. Sometimes you're not. That's okay. Don't, when you're solving these problems, don't worry about what you're solving for right away. Just get something. And if it hap you happen to get lucky and get what you're looking for, that's great. If not, that's okay. Use what you solve for to get something else. Okay, it'll work out eventually. So let's sub our numbers in here. Um, do we know what the x component of the velocity is? We do. It's 18 meters per second, right? It's 18 meters per second the whole time. So it's not vi or vf. It's just constant velocity of 18. Do we know what the horizontal displacement is? No, we don't. In fact, that horizontal displacement, is that not what I'm looking for here? 
Right? Is that not how far from the edge of the cliff this bison ends up landing? Yeah, that's what I'm looking for, right? I don't know what that is. I also don't know what the time is. How long is the bison in the air for? I don't know. Okay, was that useful to you? Was that helpful? Not particularly. That's okay. Remember what I said? There isn't really too much of a strategy for this once you get to this point. It's just sub numbers in and see what comes out of it. Nothing came out of it yet, so let's just keep working. What's delta D for the Y component? Oh, you know this. You know this. What is it? 20 meters? Almost. Yeah. Negative 20 meters, right? Because it ends up 20 meters below where it started. Okay, good. Very good. Negative 20 meters. Now, what's VI? What is it? 18? No. It's zero. Good. VI is zero. How come? How come, Christine? It's not moving vertically when it first jumps off. Good. Initially, how fast is this bison moving vertically when it runs off the edge of the cliff? Zero. It's running all horizontal, 18 meters per second horizontal. But none of it is vertical. Now, as soon as the bison leaves the cliff, he's moving downward at a certain speed, and that speed increases, right? But at the instant he leaves, his vertical speed is zero. And notice it's not just V, it's VI, the initial vertical velocity. So we cross it off, zero. Zero times time is zero. Um, this should be a half AT squared, right? So negative 20 is equal to half times negative 9.81, because that's the vertical acceleration, times t squared. So now we're going to solve for t. And here's how we're going to do it. Take the 2 over by multiplying. We've divide, One half is the same as dividing by 2, right? So we're going to take the 2 over by multiplying, and it becomes negative 40 equals negative 9.81 times t squared. And then we're going to take the 9.81 over by... Dividing, which gives me, what does that give me? We've got neg 40 divided by neg 9.81. We've got 4.077 equals t squared. And then how do we get t by itself? Yeah. So let's square root that now. Second function, square root. Second function, answer, gives me uh, 2.019. All right, is that what I'm looking for? No. Is that okay? Sure, it's fine. What do I say the strategy is? There isn't really one. Just sub your numbers in and get something. What do we just get? Well, we got time. How's that going to be helpful to me? How's that going to help me? Yeah? You can plug the time back yeah. Yeah, how come I can go, how can I put time from y into x? I can't, I can't put velocity from y into x. I can't put displacement from y into x. How come I can put time in from y into x, Ethan? Because it's, it's a scalar, right? So we're going to say 18 is equal to the displacement divided by 2.019. And that 2.019 goes up by multiplying multiply by 18, we get a displacement of 36 meters, 36.3 meters. So, how far from the edge of the cliff do these bison land? 36 meters. Next question you get, maybe exactly the same, except different context. Maybe it's guy runs off a cliff or soccer ball gets kicked off a cliff or the edge of a building or something, roof of a building, something like that. Maybe you're looking for a different variable. Maybe instead of looking for how far from the edge of the, the cliff does it land, maybe you're given where it lands and you need to find out how high the cliff is. Maybe you need to find out the initial velocity. Whatever, it doesn't matter. You're always going to start out by drawing your diagram, writing these two equations down, subbing your numbers in. Get something. Again, if it's what you're looking for right away, if we happen to get the displacement right away, great. If not, that's okay. Just keep subbing numbers in until you get something. Oftentimes, that'll be time. 
and then use that to get what you're actually looking for. All right, look at this. Three questions to work on right now. You use the analogy of baking cookies before. Look, you only got to bake three cookies. That's good news, eh? Your homework is using your recipe to bake these three cookies.